Okay. All right, good. Okay, so before the break, we kind of took a lightning tour from individual particle motions to MHD. Um, and now we're kind of going to move on to comparing different magnetospheres. And the first thing we're going to think about is uh, pressure balance at the nose of the magnetosphere, because this sets the stage for, in a global sense, what we refer to as the compressibility of the magnetospheric system. In other words, how sensitive is the size of the system to uh, changes in solar wind dynamic pressure. So um, here, the diagram shows us the sense of currents which flow uh, near the nose of the magnetopause. And they flow such that the cross product of those currents and the magnetospheric field points against the direction of the oncoming solar wind flow. And I've conveniently ignored the pesky magnetosheath because effectively the kinetic energy of the solar wind flow is converted to thermal pressure in the magnetosheath. So mathematically, it's an equivalent pressure. But it's convenient for us to think in these terms um, about upstream dynamic pressure, which is density times bulk velocity squared, okay, and internal magnetic pressure, which is this B squared over 2 mu naught term. Um, and in the homework problems, uh, there is a problem associated with this scenario, where, um, which is related to a classical model of magnetopause currents or plasma cloud currents, more correctly, uh, by Chapman and Ferraro. And this involves a thing called an image dipole. So if you guys have a go at that problem, it's very useful because it sort of um, consolidates the picture that uh, these currents also act to intensify the internal uh, magnetic field and, and you know, change somewhat the dipole field structure. Anyway, the, the lesson here is that the magnetopause currents act to hold off solar wind flow. And we can determine the location of the uh, magnetopause nose by applying this pressure balance condition, where we are equating internal magnetic pressure of the system with the external solar wind dynamic pressure. Now, despite the fact that these Chapman-Ferraro currents are flowing and intensifying the dipole field, it's still a good approximation for us to simply equate the dipole field at the magnetopause location with solar wind dynamic pressure. We've know, we know from previous lectures and from our own experience that the dipole field falls off as 1 over radial distance cubed. And you can convince yourself that if you do the calculation, you end up with standoff distance of the magnetopause from planet center is proportional to the minus 1 6 power of solar wind dynamic pressure. So we get that relationship. It's a pretty good approximation for the Earth. And my, quest, my first question for you guys this session is that we saw in the previous session that this J cross B force is not only equal to a magnetic pressure gradient, but also a magnetic curvature force. Remember, the two add together. So why is it, do you think, that this is a good approximation at this kind of a boundary. Why don't we need to consider curvature force in our balance condition? Because? That's exactly right, yes. So let me go to the next slide, because that's got a bit more detail um, about the answer. So essentially, all you need to do is think about comparing the length scales across which magnetic pressure is acting. And, along, uh, and at which uh, curvature force is acting. So magnetic pressure is a, uh, acting essentially across the width of the MPCL, the magnetopause current layer. And this is tiny compared to the radius of curvature of a typical field line here, which is being essentially squashed against the, the magnetopause boundary. So that means, therefore, that your curvature force, which is inversely proportional to radius of curvature, is going to be negligible compared to the magnetic pressure gradient. OK, so for the Earth, uh, magnetopause standoff distance scales as the minus 1 6 power of dynamic pressure. So here's Fran's famous diagram showing 
information about this quantity at other planets. Uh, and it's really useful for us to look at her table, which compares the actual typical magnetopause standoff distance for different planets here, Mercury, Earth, Saturn, Jupiter, with the prediction that we would come up with if we simply equated the magnetic pressure of their dipole field with the solar wind dynamic pressure. So you can see that this dipole approximation works pretty well at Mercury and the Earth. At Saturn and Jupiter, not so, not so well. Okay, so the observed uh, size of the mag well, size scale, let's say, of the magnetosphere at Saturn and Jupiter is inflated compared to the vacuum dipole approximation. That suggests that there's an, in an extra internal source of pressure, which is also effective at holding off the, uh, the flow of the solar wind. And indeed, at Jupiter and Saturn, that's due to an important uh, population of hot plasma inside the magnetosphere. And in the diagrams on the right here, what Fran and um, Crusher have done is to uh, show solar wind flowing in to uh, this variety of magnetospheres. And they've scaled each diagram so that the same distance in each diagram corresponds to the dipole approximation, standoff distance. And so you can easily see that for Mercury and the Earth, this is coincident with the actual standoff distance at which the solar wind is being held off. But at Saturn, and especially at Jupiter, the true magnetosphere is inflated beyond this dipole prediction. Um, Fran mentioned uh, yesterday the range of, or the typical range of magnetopause standoff distances for Jupiter and Saturn. We found that for both planets, using spacecraft observations, that the boundary tends to spend its time at one of two preferred sizes, a, a compressed and an expanded configuration. And it turns out that if we compare the statistical distribution of magnetopause size at these planets uh, with the distribution of solar wind dynamic pressure, and we assume a one-to-one -one mapping between the two, the observed variability in the magnetopause size requires significantly more variability in the dynamic pressure than what is observed. Okay? And that, again, is probably, or plausibly, a good indication that there is also an internal driver at these worlds which determines magnetopause standoff distance. And we'll see that that is indeed the case. OK? So let's remind ourselves of what's different about Saturn and Jupiter compared to the Earth. Probably the main point of departure is that these worlds have a strong internal source of plasma for the magnetosphere. At Saturn on the left here, it's the icy moon Enceladus. This is a false color image from the imaging science subsystem on board Cassini, showing us the famous water plumes erupting through fissures in the southern ice sheet of Enceladus. These add something like tens to hundreds of uh, kilograms per second of water group ions, typically, to the, the, the Cronian magnetosphere. And I think I mentioned last week that the first indication of these plumes was um, a distortion in the magnetic field uh, on the first Enceladus flyby performed by Cassini. Okay. Uh, on the right here, we've got Io, the volcanic moon of Jupiter, and the internal engine for Jupiter's magnetospheric dynamics, adding of the order of uh, one ton per second of sulfur and oxygen plasma to the system. And what's kind of interesting is that although Io, um, in absolute terms, is, is a stronger mass source, uh, because Jupiter's magnetic field is much stronger than that of Saturn, the magnetic moment of Jupiter is 20,000 terrestrial units, Saturn something like 500, um, it turns out that the, uh, the, the, the relative distortion of the field from Io uh, you know, mass loading is smaller than the degree to which Enceladus mass loading can distort magnetospheric structure at Saturn. So although that's in absolute terms a higher plasma mass loading source, in relative terms Enceladus is better at distorting uh, Saturn's magnetospheric structure. But the important thing here is that they are internal uh, mass sources, very important for the magnetospheric dynamics uh, of these worlds. And of course, our own moon um, 
is nowhere near as, as active as these. So that's kind of the main point of departure. Okay, so to illustrate the internal driver that I've been talking about at Saturn, um, I thought it would be interesting as a case study to talk about some work that a graduate student, Nathan Pilkington, has been doing recently at UCL. And Nathan has been doing the rather um, thankless task of studying hundreds and hundreds of magnetopause crossings in Cassini data. Um, and he has magnetic field information, and the plasma teams have provided him with plasma pressure information as well. And using all that information, what one can do is um, construct uh, or try to construct a simple power law, like the one that we've just derived, which relates magnetopause standoff distance to solar wind dynamic pressure. Now, we don't have a dedicated uh, solar wind monitor just upstream of Saturn. You know, so when Cassini is doing many orbits inside the magnetosphere, we really have no idea about what's upstream. So what we've done with this work is we've assumed um, a pressure balance across the boundary. So we've assumed a boundary that's always in equilibrium, which in nature is rarely the case. But the idea is that if you do many crossings, statistically, you can get an idea of the average location of the boundary. So using the magnetic field and the plasma data, we're able to give some kind of estimate of upstream solar wind dynamic pressure. And then you can construct a model of the surface, a simple geometrical model, and um, change the parameters of that model to give the best fit to the position of your magnetopause crossings. Yes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. The question was, do we have to take the angle between the solar wind direction and the boundary into account? And yes, absolutely you do. The important quantity, uh, you know, the, the pressure balance condition we considered before was at the nose of the magnetopause, where the solar wind flow is head on, coming at us head on. If you're away from the nose, the important quantity is the projection of the solar wind pressure normal to the boundary. So that's what we've done here. Um, okay, so each point in here represents information from a magnetopause crossing. Uh, R0 here is the standoff distance that we get from fitting a geometrical model. And this is the logarithm of our estimate of solar wind dynamic pressure. So a simple power law like this on this diagram would be a straight line. Okay, we've fitted straight lines to the data using slightly different techniques. Uh, and you can see that there's a lot of scatter about these linear fits. Not only that, but we get alpha unusually large, which is a bit suspicious. Okay? It's unusually large not only compared to the vacuum dipole value, but also previous estimates of Saturn's uh, magnetospheric compressibility alpha. So, so what's going on? So we thought, well, you know, there's just a lot of scatter in the data, and alpha is not very well constrained. But then Nathan, since he had um, information about hot plasma pressure, he said, well, you know, what, what if I just plot this data again and I color code it according to interior plasma beta? And when you do that, I hope you'll be convinced that the color scale shows us that at a fixed dynamic pressure, uh, the size of the boundary increases in a good correlation with colors that indicate increasing interior plasma beta. So to me, this is fairly compelling evidence that at Saturn, we have an additional driver of magnetospheric size, which is related to the interior plasma beta of the hot population just inside the magnetopause boundary. OK? So uh, in, an, in an attempt to do some a complementary modeling exercise related to this observational result, um, what we thought we'd do is take a model, uh, a very simple model of Saturn's magnetosphere that we have at UCL. Um, and this is the so-called magnetodisc model. And this is based on a, a, on a previous formalism um, that was used by Gerard Codal for Jupiter in the mid-80s. Okay? And we adapted it for Saturn using Cassini data. So we wanted to use this model to essentially come up with a synthetic power law for Saturn of how you know, magnetosphere size changes with solar wind dynamic pressure. 
So um, essentially, we build this model of a self-consistent magnetic field and plasma distribution uh, by doing a calculation which balances centrifugal force, plasma pressure gradient, and magnetic force in an axisymmetric system. Now, the real system is an axisymmetric, but you know, you've got to start somewhere, and you sacrifice some realism to gain some insight. That's what you always do right, in modeling. Um, so here are some typical model outputs. The top two are color scales of constant magnetic potential. And in this model, um, constant magnetic potential follows a magnetic field line. So here you've got a vacuum dipole. And here you've got sort of a typical uh, field structure at Saturn. And if you look at the yellow dipole field line, it's been stretched out you know, to, a, to a much larger radial distance, which is the effect of the magnetospheric current sheet or ring current, whatever you want to call it. OK, and here are the corresponding distributions of plasma pressure. Uh, this is the log of plasma pressure. This is magnetic pressure with the white curves indicating plasma beta. That's changing as you go towards the equatorial cold plasma sheet. OK, so what we did is, it did is we took this model and we just said, well, we're just going to uh, calculate the total plasma plus magnetic pressure uh, at the, uh, the, you know, the exterior uh, you know, the last pixel in the model in the equatorial plane, and we're going to set that equal to solar wind dynamic pressure. So that's a proxy for our modeled dynamic pressure. And the nice thing is that in this model, we can vary two parameters to see how size changes. So we, we model magnetopause radius, which is linked, of course, to dynamic pressure, because that's going to change the pressure that we see at the last uh, point in the model. And we can also uh, change the global hot plasma content or the, the, the pressure profile of hot plasma that we use, and that's the internal driver. So although it's greatly simplified, this is a nice sort of tool for learning something about the compressibility of the system because in a, in a fairly simple way we can change the internal and the external driver. So this graph shows us essentially the results of doing a few model calculations and plotting the uh, magnetopause radius of the model uh, against the estimated solar wind dynamic pressure. And uh, what we have here, the dashed curves show us power laws corresponding to alpha 4, a Jovian type value, 5, which is not far from Saturn values from previous studies, and 6, which is, of course, the classic vacuum dipole. The three colored curves show us uh, size versus pressure for three different internal states of the system, which are characterized by hot pressure content. And we refer to them as quiet, medium, and disturbed ring current states. And you can see that, again, at a fixed solar wind pressure, as you go to higher internal pressure, as you would expect, you hold off the solar wind um, at larger standoff distances. So the other important thing about these calculations, although we need to do more of them to fill in the gaps between the points, uh, the compressibility itself changes with system size. In particular, as you expand beyond about 25 Saturn radii or so, the field becomes significantly disk-like and thin. Uh, that gives you a different characteristic fall-off of field strength with distance compared to a dipole. In fact, you see that effect um, pretty much at all of these distances at Saturn. But that, uh, that changes with, as you go particularly to expanded systems. And also, as, as you go to expanded systems, um, the hot pressure seems to play a more and more dominant role in this pressure balance across the boundary. So for those who are interested, there is a slide in here um, where we've separated the different contributions to the pressure at the boundary and how they change with system size. In the interests of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but essentially we've got curves here showing the different behavior of magnetic uh, and then cold and hot plasma pressures as a function of size. This point at 20 is probably an artifact of how we characterize hot pressure, but I think the general trend of uh, hot pressure overtaking cold pressure as system size increases is, is, is a real one, and it's telling us something about how uh, an internal driver, as well as um, magnetic field, changes the compressibility of the system. Yes. 
I would say so, because at Saturn, um, although our model, you know, it's a simplification, our model has a smooth uh, profile for plasma pressure at all distances. If you look at the actual data, as you go into the outer magnetosphere, um, you see isolated blobs of plasma quite often. So it's not a smooth, continuous structure. It's, a, it's, a very, it's very dynamic out there, yes. It's very squishy, yes. And so you have this Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have a diagram of it in this talk, but whenever we compare our idealized model to, uh, you know, the MIMI team's hot pressure observations, um, when you're in the middle inner magnetosphere, it, it looks pretty good. And as soon as you go into the outer magnetosphere near the boundary, uh, the observations in pressure are very discontinuous. You have isolated patches of hot pressure, probably corresponding to blobs of plasma rather than a nice continuous structure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good way to look at it. That's a really good way to look at it, yeah. At the Earth. At the Earth, the dark hole field with the plasma Yeah. Yep. So, okay, yeah. So to summarize, when we compare the Earth with the giant worlds, it's whisk versus disk. How about that? <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, all right. So uh, the other thing I wanted to, to mention um, is kind of related to something I mentioned last week and also related to this curious property of Saturn's internal uh, dipole that it's pretty much parallel to the rotation axis. Now, if you can cast your mind back to last week, I showed you some Galileo data from Jupiter. Um, and we saw magnetic signatures of the spacecraft encountering the plasma disk or the current sheet where the radial field was changing with time. And that's kind of fairly straightforward to understand at Jupiter because Jupiter has a rotating tilted dipole. So if you're traveling in the rotational equator, Sometimes you find yourself above the current sheet, sometimes below. So this is the change in sign of the radial field. Now at Saturn, the dipole is not tilted, right? But we still see changes in the radial field. So what's going on? Why, why is that happening? How, how is a seemingly rotational modulation being imposed on the magnetic signal at Saturn when the internal field of the planet itself is not a rotating tilted dipole? And this is a, a question that's been, a, as you can imagine, a source of much active research uh, in the Saturn community. But to give you folks an idea of the kind of data that illustrate this, um, this is a diagram from a paper by Dave Andrews and co. Um, 
who studied the global magnetospheric oscillations associated with this effect known as the rotational anomaly or camshaft signal at Saturn. So what Dave has done here is for two orbits of Cassini data, he has subtracted a reliable internal field model from the magnetometer observations. Hence, what you have left over is uh, an observation of the, uh, the, the, the field due to external sources, right? And we have here, uh, you know, pairs of panels um, corresponding to the radial, meridional, and azimuthal spherical polar components of this so-called perturbation field, this field due to ex sources external to the planet. Um, and uh, in these pairs of panels, you have the data itself and then smoothed data to highlight this uh, you know, periodicity that we believe is close, but not exactly at Saturn's rotational period. Okay? So this is something you can do. What do you find? You find that the magnetosphere is separated into two distinct regions according to the phase relation between the radial and the, and the azimuthal components. In the core region, closer than about 12 Saturn radii, uh, those two components essentially look like what you would expect if you had a dipole lying in the equatorial plane, a transverse type dipole, just rotating around and around. When you go past that region into the outer magnetosphere, the um, radial and azimuthal uh, perturbation fields vary pretty much in antiphase. And that's a signature of a classical sort of oscillating current sheet. OK, so what's going on? So you can use these um, uh, phase relations to build a picture of the kind of current that you need to be flowing to generate this sort of field. That turns out to be um, field aligned current that's flowing along you know, magnetic field lines at the distance where this transition happens at about 12 Saturn radii or so. All right, so we can build a picture of this current systems. Still not really sure what drives it or what the source of energy is. And those oscillations uh, also drive uh, small changes in the position of the magnetopause. So the magnetopause position also oscillates because of the rotating current systems that generate these field perturbations. OK. There was a very good review, which if you're interested, I recommend you read by Carberry and Mitchell, which talks about the uh, periodicities in other data sets, particularly SKR, Saturn Kilometric Radiation, and ENA, Energetic Neutral Atom, um, observations. And um, somewhat interestingly, uh, it turns out that uh, the picture is even more complicated than we thought. So initially, the observations show that this period drifted with time. It wasn't a fixed period. And now, additional analysis that's been possible because of additional spacecraft orbits uh, seem to indicate that there are two distinct periods, not just one. OK? So this is um, SKR rotation rate and period versus time over several years. The red dots, while the black dots indicate uh, a period which seems to dominate when the spacecraft is in the southern hemisphere, and the red dots a period which arises in the northern hemisphere. All right, so the observations show us that the picture is more complicated, and obviously that makes it more difficult for us to come up with a, a model, you know, uh, an explanation for what we're seeing. Okay, so the periods them, oh, and obviously these two periods drift with time. And so the relative phase between the northern and the southern oscillation can also change. And you get interesting effects like beating and all this kind of stuff. Okay? So the, the question remains, what's the source of energy? Physically, what's driving the underlying current systems of which there appear to be two distinct ones? And I'm not going to go into huge detail, but I've listed some uh, candidate explanations from the literature some which involve a kind of magnetospheric anomaly, uh, and some which I personally am inclined towards, which uh, invoke an atmospheric explanation. So one of our ex-graduates from UCL, Chris Smith, 
uh, has a thermospheric model of Saturn. And he published uh, a numerical experiment that he did with this model where he imposed a source of heating, physical origin unknown, which was able to um, cause a vortex pattern of flow to, to arise in the planet's atmosphere. And it turns out that if you calculate the field aligned current associated with this vortex and the kind of phase relations that would impose on the magnetosphere, then you get good qualitative agreement with the observations. Quantitative agreement, not so great. Uh, and some work that was done around the same time by uh, Shinja Jha and co. Uh, he's based at the University of Michigan. He kind of went to the other side. He has an MHD model of Saturn's magnetosphere. And he drove that with an assumed ionospheric flow as an inner boundary. And if you get the properties of that flow correct, you can get quantitative agreement with the oscillations. And the nice thing about the atmospheric explanation is that if your current system is rooted in the atmosphere rather than the deep planet, um, it can drift with time according to atmospheric flows. Okay, So uh, that's all well and good. And they found, and, and Jha et al. required an unusually strong flow shear of 6 kilometers per second over something like 10 degrees interval of latitude. Now, ultimately, what we'd like to do, although it's very ambitious, is to couple a detailed thermospheric and magnetospheric uh, model so we can fully, fully capture all the very complicated details of this coupling. Um, and some more recent uh, work by Southwood and Cowley um, uh, sort of point, uh, you know, favors a hydromagnetic wave type model associated with field aligned currents at the polar cap boundaries. So there's different ideas about what drives the, the anomaly at Saturn, and I think that's an ongoing debate. All right. So now moving on to Jupiter. Um, probably Fran's favorite planet, I guess. Uh, a rapidly rotating magnetosphere. Um, here's Fran and Steve's diagram showing us not only the usual you know, asymmetry between the daytime and nighttime fields, but also the so-called me uh, middle magnetosphere dominated by this rotating plasma disk um, and the associated current stretches out the dipole field lines into a disk-like shape. Okay? So rotation very fast, period just under 10 hours. The planet itself is something like 11 uh, Earth radii in radius. Uh, magnetic moment, some, almost 20,000 terrestrial units. And typical magnetopause size, something like 60 to 90 R Jupiter uh, on the day side boundary. OK, and as Fran mentioned, the magnetospheric, the magnetospheric compressibility of Jupiter indicates that the system is very squishy. Um, and if we want to do a pressure balance calculation, you have to include not only the effects of B, which itself is distorted by strong centrifugal force into this disk-like field, but also uh, plasma beta um, contribution from the hot plasma population, which is also a strong component of this internal pressure. OK, so the characteristic uh, compressibility index is 1 over 4, very compressible compared to the Earth's 1 over 6. And the disk-like obstacle presented to the solar wind probably means that the magnetopause boundary itself um, is somewhat flattened at the poles. We certainly have seen evidence for that flattening uh, at Saturn using the Cassini um, magnetopause crossing database that's been uh, assembled by Pilkington. OK, so as I mentioned, the key internal driver at Jupiter is Io, the volcanic moon. It's an internal source of plasma. It adds something like a ton uh, a second of plasma to the system. Uh, that forms a torus of plasma near Io's orbit. But of course, that plasma can't build up indefinitely. It's got to go somewhere. So somehow, that plasma has got to move radially from the Io torus and form this enormous disk and eventually get lost from the system somehow. You've got to keep cycling plasma through the system. Otherwise, it just builds up indefinitely. 
So some work that um, I think Fran was involved in by Delamere et al. modeled uh, physical chemistry conditions uh, in the plasma tori of both Io and Enceladus. Uh, and they came up with some very important results. So essentially, uh, these models looked at the ultimate destiny of ions which were injected into the system. So, uh, you know, ions which were formed through the ionization of neutrals coming out from Io and Enceladus. So these models included energy input from hot electrons and Coulomb heating of electrons by ions, as well as electron impact ionization and charge exchange reactions. And it turns out that at Saturn, neutrals are more dominant uh, in the system. So you have a ratio of neutrals to ions of something like 12 near the torus compared to something like 1% for Jupiter. And because you have a, a, a higher source of neutrals at Saturn, charge exchange reaction between torus ions and ambient neutrals become a more important source of escape of material from the system. If you've got a torus ion, which is rotating around and has a lot of <coughs> rotational energy, it can exchange charge with a neutral. So a hot ion and a cold neutral changes and gives you a hot neutral and a cold ion. That hot neutral has lots of energy now, doesn't feel the influence of fields, and can possibly escape from the system, or go a long way at least. So that's an important route for plasma transport. So um, that's reflected in particle losses at Jupiter. About half of the plasma added um, effectively escapes through that charge exchange process. And that leaves half of it to be transported radially outward. Whereas at Saturn, something like 95% uh, of that added plasma uh, leaves through that charge exchange process. Okay. So how is this radial transport of plasma, um, how does it happen? You know, what's, what's the physics behind it? Some, some uh, things we can think about to try and you know, guide our picture of what happens are as follows. We know that the average configuration, because of the strong uh, rotation imposed by the planet on the magnetospheric flows, is a plasma concentrated into a relatively thin near equatorial plasma sheet. So that's one important thing we know about the structure. In an average sense, something like a ton per second of plasma must be lost from the system on average to balance the incoming source from IO. So the transport process has to achieve this. And then not only that, but the net transport of this material from IO orbit um, has to take place in a region where we know that the field is quasi-dipolar and doesn't really become strongly distorted. Okay, so if you do observations of the field in this quasi-dipolar region, which contains Io's plasma torus, that field's pretty much dipolar. doesn't really distort very much or reconfigure. So, so how are we going to transport plasma without disturbing the field? It doesn't really makes sense, right? So the conclusion of this kind of thinking is that we need a mode of transport where we displace plasma mass, but not magnetic flux. And we can achieve that through a process known as interchange, which I think of as a process which relies on the development of texture in an otherwise smooth plasma. So what do we mean by that? A simple picture that you can think of to, you know, to illustrate this is uh, a, an experiment that you can do in, in a laboratory here on the Earth. So gravity acts downwards here on the Earth. And if you're very careful, you can set up a, a tank in the lab and you can pour oil in the bottom and very carefully cover that with a layer of water, which is higher density. Okay? Now, obviously, that's an unstable equilibrium, right? Because if the water was on the bottom and the oil on the top, that would be a system of much lower gravitational potential energy. And systems always want to drive towards lower energy states. So this, uh, this, so this is an equilibrium, but it's not stable. You know, if you thump your fist on the table in the lab, you'll see these two layers of liquid mix and overturn. Okay? 
So the reason that happens is because the density gradient of the fluid is opposing one of the main driving forces associated with the equilibrium. So if we were to introduce a small perturbation, this is a cartoon of what would happen. So the system would try to evolve to a more stable equilibrium with water on the bottom, oil on the top, characterized by a minimum in some sort of potential energy. And we'd see fingers or droplets or blobs of fluid at the interface as this mixing and overturning gradually happen. So now, if we make an analogy with the Jovian magnetosphere, and if we think of replacing the higher density water by a higher density cold plasma near the Io Taurus, if we replace oil by hotter, more tenuous plasma, corresponding to hot plasma injections at the Jovian magnetosphere, these, might, these may be associated with reconnection, for example. And if we replace gravity by centrifugal force in the Jovian disk, once you're out past a few Jupiter radii, centrifugal force laughs at gravity. It's, it's easily the most dominant force, OK? So that decrease, this is, this is sort of what's happening. That's what's driving this interchange process. So the decrease in centrifugal potential in this interchange must compensate heating of inward moving flux tubes. As long as you can do that, you can drive that interchange. And if you have a particular, a strong enough gradient in cold plasma, ions per unit flux decreasing with distance, you also need that condition to be satisfied. So what's happening then is that <clears throat> this interchange of flux tubes is continually happening at Jupiter to move cold plasma outward and you know, relatively empty flux tubes inward. The empty flux tubes you can think of as being filled up again at the Io Taurus, and the whole thing keeps repeating itself. The gradient in the plasma is maintained by the, excuse me, by the continual addition of material at Io and the continual evacuation of flux tubes in the outer magnetosphere. If those two things weren't happening, interchange would act to just smooth out the plasma gradient, and you, and you wouldn't have a terribly interesting system after a while. OK, so yes, Carl. <coughs> yes. Yeah. It um, flow along the field for the cold plasma at Jupiter is inhibited by the strong centrifugal force. Okay. So, um, all right. So we have this idea of flux tube interchange, um, a relatively hot, empty flux tube changing positions with a cold one, and that happening repeatedly and stuff gradually moving out uh, on a time scale of tens of days okay, to, to, to go all the way out to the boundary. So it's a very sort of gradual process. Do we see evidence of this in the observations? Yeah, it, it acts because the gradient, yeah, you're continually adding material. Once you're out past a few planetary radii, centrifugal force dominates gravity easily. Exactly. Yeah. OK. So here are, um, here's observational evidence of this mode of transport due to interchange. This is Galileo data that was studied by Kivelson et al. Um, and what we have is, again, spherical polar components of the field and total field strength. And every so often, 
uh, you would see a step change in the field from the background field of the cold plasma to the higher magnetic pressure of a relatively empty flux tube. So pressure balance is maintained across the boundary of the flux tube. And so if you've got smaller plasma pressure inside, you must also have higher magnetic pressure. And there's a problem on the homework associated with this. Okay, So this is evidence of these um, tenuous flux tubes moving in um, against the background uh, of cold plasma. Another interesting thing here is if you look at a couple of the field components, um, outside the flux tube, you have these evidence of waves. And these are ion cyclotron waves associated with ions being added to the torus. You don't see them um, in the empty flux tube, which suggests that the plasma there has been uh, injected relatively recently. And so the waves there have not had enough time to grow. And you can use that constraint to um, also constrain the distance at which that injection uh, probably took place. So um, here's Kivelson et al.'s schematic of what's going on near the IO torus in terms of interchange. So this is uh, IO, this is its orbit, and these are inward and outward moving flux tubes. The heavier tubes laden with cold plasma in this picture are outward moving. Close to IO, the magnetometer data indicates that those outward uh, motions are dominant presumably balanced by inward motions of the um, hot, tenuous flux tubes at other longitudes. So overall, these motions have to give you a net outflow of plasma um, to, to balance the, the, the plasma loading rate at the iogenic source. OK, so if you're interested um, in reading more about interchange, which is a very interesting process, um, here are some of the initial papers on the subject and some more recent ones. And you can also read about uh, observational signatures of um, interchange that have also been observed at Saturn. Thank you. We have a little bit of timing problem here. Okay. Um, we're switch the aurora, the yeah. Sexy movie. You've got to share the sexy movie. Sure. Okay. So I was going to move on to uh, a rural talking about the aurora of different planets. So I've got an introduction about the Earth's aurora, but you've, you've seen that before in the current systems associated with the Dungy cycle. And if I go to this movie here of the Jovian aurora, hopefully this will work. Uh, yep, 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 yep. Okay, so what I wanted to illustrate here is that there's a really huge uh, difference between the main oval at Jupiter, which is this sort of kidney bean shaped structure that's being carried around by planetary rotation, and the oval at the Earth. The oval at the Earth changes size in response to reconnection rate. Look at the oval at Jupiter, it's, it's very persistent in size. It's, it just looks like it's painted onto the surface of the planet and is carried around by rotation. So that's evidence that. Um, the auroral over Jupiter comes about from a very different mechanism, and in particular, an internal mechanism associated with rotation. You also see, you know, auroral features dancing around uh, inside the oval, which are, which are maybe uh, uh, associated with um, a solar wind type effect. Yeah. Okay. And you also notice, in particular, outside the main oval, that you have a spot-like aurora associated with currents that are flowing along field lines between Jupiter and Io. OK, so that's the Io-Jupiter interaction. So in, in, the, in the limited <laughs> time remaining, what I can do is show you a projection of a typical HST image to highlight, again, the main oval the IO spot, and just to be really controversial, uh, we, we don't know definitively what causes a lot of these features. Maybe they're associated with solar wind uh, interactions. Maybe it's a cusp-like feature. Don't know for sure. 
it's more but it's open. Really yeah. So, so here is, I won't, I won't spend too much time, but here is sort of the mechanism through which Jupiter's auroral oval is created. Main point of departure from the Earth is that it's internally driven through rotation. In particular, a different rotation rate between the planet and the plasma disk. So plasma flowing out from Io in an attempt to conserve its angular momentum wants to rotate more slowly. As soon as it does that, it bends the field those field lines are connected all the way to the planet's ionosphere, and that sets up a system of current which transfers angular momentum from the planet to the plasma in an attempt to keep it rotating with the planet. Yes? So it's not, it's, it's, we're not seeing this primarily It's right here. It's IO. It's pretty much all from Io. It's yes. <laughs> okay. So this is. So this is what. So these are the current systems that's sorry. These are the current systems that's uh, responsible for the field line current driving auroral emission at Jupiter. The the point of commonality with the Earth is that we see field line current whenever we have shear in plasma flow. Okay. So at the Earth, that shear is between the stuff moving across the polar cap and the stuff just outside the polar cap that's coming back round to the day side. Remember the Dungy cycle twin vortex that you've seen. Here the shear in plasma flow is the change in rotation rate of the plasma as one goes out to larger distances. Plasma flows more slowly. That shear drives field aligned current. Okay? So that's a point of commonality. And there's kind of a subtle thing here too, because this entire magnetic framework that uh, you know uh, against which the current system rests can be compressed or expanded by solar wind. So the solar wind does can play some role even here. Okay, uh, right. <laughs> okay, so this slide was just to show that on rare occasions Jupiter's auroral oval can expand by a few degrees equatorward it can become even coincident with the auroral footprint of Ganymede. We've been doing some work on what causes that, and we believe that it's a combination, and we do need a combination, of an increased mass loading of the disk by the iogenic source, plus something changing about the hot particle population, and particularly here, pressure anisotropy plays a role, but that's a whole other thing. Ask me later about that because that's that's a whole other thing. Okay, now Saturn's aurora is different. It, it's apparently not driven by rotation and that kind of mechanism. The bright auroral oval has an Earth-like response to solar wind compression regions. Um, these are two HST images of the southern uh, UV aurora at Saturn, taken 30 hours before and 10 hours after the passage of a solar wind shock, which was uh, observed by Cassini that was upstream of Saturn at this time. And you can see that the response of the aurora is Earth-like. You've got filling in uh, of the, the dawn side emissions, so a contraction of the polar cap um, corresponding to the closure of open magnetic flux, probably in the magneto tail. Here's the heuristic model that was used by those authors to explain what was going on. So they believe that you know, Saturn has a polar cap of open magnetic flux. But now, instead of the nice twin uh, vortices of the Dungy cycle, planetary rotation um, is important in shaping these flows. We'll see why right at the end. Uh, and so you have a mainly, you can think of one of these Dungy cells growing and dominating the other due to the effect of planetary rotation. So you also have, we believe, uh, rotation dominated flow um, at the polar cap and field aligned current flowing. Um, you know, near the open closed field line boundary. So in summary, uh, here's a table 
showing you some properties of the three comparison planets, uh, and in particular the fact that all main ovals involve some kind of shear in plasma flow, the auroral energy dissipated through the processes of particle precipitation and dual heating, uh, tens, of, tens, hundreds of gigawatt at the Earth, hundreds of terawatts at Jupiter, to give you an idea of the, the range in energies. And an important ratio here is the ratio between the rotation rate of the planet and the time it takes for upstream solar wind to travel through a distance comparable to the day side magnetopause standoff distance. That ratio is enormous for the Earth. So uh, as far as the solar wind con is concerned, the Earth is pretty much standing still. Everything's flows are dominated by the Dungy cycle. The ratios are much smaller at Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, so by the time flux tubes have crossed the polar cap, the planet has rotated many times, and so that's going to influence polar cap flows in addition to the action of the solar wind. Near, the near final slide mentions the ice giants that Fran has uh, already mentioned yesterday. So just to repeat here, the large angles between the dipole and rotation of uh, axes of these worlds predict dr uh, dramatic magnetospheric reconfigurations here in the plasma sheet and in the field structure. Um, axisymmetric models probably aren't going to do us much good here. So this is kind of a whole other level of complexity. And <clears throat> finally, I'll leave you with my summary slide. Uh, mentioning missions to Jupiter, such as Juno and Juice, which I hope some of you will get involved in, maybe, um, and a reading list which is not exhaustive, but I think is a good one. Thank you. <laughs>